Well, Annie, what was your experience then of the role of women in the service? How did you find the atmosphere? Well, I think it was sort of two steps forward, one step back, because, of course, they did make massive contributions to the intelligence effort during the wars and things like that. However, by the 1960s, uh, women, when they got married within the service, were required to leave and be supported by their husbands. So I was actually still in the early 1990s working with people who'd had to resign because they got married in the 60s, who then reapplied and became workers in MI5. Um, but yes, I mean, in terms of job opportunities, it is an equal opportunities employer, all the rest of it. But um, I think if you wanted to have a normal family life and things and you don't want to be on call 24-7, then quite often you will not put yourself forward for the career advancing sexy jobs like being an agent runner or being someone who plans technical operations for example and those tend to be the sort of headline grabbing postings mm. that will advance you through the service so yes of course there are always um, exceptions that prove a rule like two female DGs which we've had in the last but, 15 but years. those two female DGs they would have done those jobs where they were on call 24 7 they would have been agent runners in the past would they I they were indeed, you. yes. They both yeah, were. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, I mean, d Annie, how did you feel when you realised that MI5 felt that you were right for them? Wasn't that rather a strange moment? <laughs> Well, coming from my background, yes, I mean, my family was a family of journalists and, uh, you know, when you're being recruited, it's, you think, my God, it's MI5, so you're entirely honest, you know, no sort of little blanks in your CV or anything. And I kept saying, you know, these are my ethical concerns, these are my views, this is my morality, this is why I might be interested in this job, and expecting to be knocked back. And yet, you know, they still kept reassuring me that they had to obey the law and they didn't get involved in things like torture and they didn't believe in internment. And yet, of course, once you get there, you find that actually that's more PR sometimes. And I do think that's quite often women perhaps might be more reluctant to bend the rules, to break the law, to cut corners. So, for example, the current culture where uh, MI5 has been investigated for complicity in torture might well be a contributing factor to not being able to retain good female officers and certainly perhaps not recruit them. Well, I, I mean, Christopher, what would you say about that? Women perhaps less likely to be keen on cutting corners, just not part of the female, the traditional female mindset. Well, the, the reality of MI5 is that one of the first courses that uh, people go on once they get into MI5 is one on ethics and uh, before the I suppose you know the most difficult part of the job uh, that is to say getting involved in surveillance um, placing hidden microphones and so on uh, there has to be a home office warrant which is uh, signed off by the home secretary now you know, I won't, don't want to overstate this but I was anxious while I was in MI5 to see how far the theory corresponded to practice and over 30 years I only found one example uh, in which that rule had not been uh, obeyed. And what had happened then uh, was that it was assumed the Home Secretary was going to sign something off and the Home Secretary didn't. But you know, the idea that young recruits to MI5, female or male, uh, and uh, less interested in ethics than the rest of us uh, is just cloud cuckoo land. All, I mean, I thought that uh, the, the young women and men that I met in MI5 were really quite similar to the ones I met at Cambridge University. Bright, but certainly not amoral. Annie, what about women who are older than 20, 30, and maybe even thinking about going back to work? Would it be possible for a woman in her 40s to start a career at MI5? Yes, absolutely. I mean, again, um, they are always looking for people with outside experience and um, someone, I mean, I, my very first manager when I was in MI5 was someone who'd come from the local government sector and she was a woman. So again, you know, they want people, they want cross-pollination with different areas. I just like to take issue, I mean, with what Christopher just said, I'm saying exactly the opposite of what he just tried to assert, which is, of course, a lot of young recruits go in very idealistically and they do have strong ethical frameworks and that is actually what attracts them to the job. What can be the problem is when they see things going wrong on the inside. There is no meaningful path to take that will realistically change the existing culture. Right, but that's true of... get a sort of group think going. That's true of men, young men and young women, in your experience. Absolutely. Annie. And, you know, people who are recruited tend to have the highest ethical standards. And, you know, so they should for a very secretive organisation. But again and again, I saw many cases where things like telephone intercept were put on without the due checks being taken, which made them de facto Well, I mean, those, illegal, those, are, so. those may well, you allege, have been some of your own experiences. I, of course, don't know whether you're telling the complete truth or not, Annie. Well, um, I know that's your opinion. Uh, Christopher, what do you say about what Annie has just suggested very well, briefly? Well, all, all I can just, you know, I think the best thing I can do is just comment on the, uh, on the present situation. Um, people are instructed, and I've quoted in my book, um, The History of MI5, uh, the exact document. It is their duty 
if they think that anything's wrong, um, to go and complain about mm. it. No, they don't have to go to the line manager. There are staff councillors. Um, there is a former senior member of the uh, of, of the service, actually the, the man who runs the the ethics uh, councils, who, who they can go to. Uh, so I actually think that uh, it's rather easier in many ways for people. I'm, you know, of course, MI5 is not a perfect organisation. Neither the BBC, neither is Cambridge University. But I think actually there are more opportunities, not less, uh, in MI5 than is average to air ethical concerns. Thank you both very much indeed for talking to us this morning, uh, Professor Christopher. Anderson. Andrew, the author of The Authorised History of MI5, and you also heard from Annie Mashin, a former MI5 intelligence officer.